Teams. We are using Teams uh, as a webinar tool for the first time today, so we're hoping there won't be any technical glitches, but just let us know if you're having issues with anything in the chat. Uh, please keep your cameras and microphones off just to make everything streamlined. We will run through a short presentation today um, and then we will provide any answers to questions already submitted and then any questions that come up throughout the presentation, just pop them in the chat and we'll try and get to them. We're hoping to wrap up the presentation and questions by 12.45 sharp uh, and we will be recording the presentation. So I'll run through the uh, people that are going to be presenting and then um, the people that are on the chat just helping us out with questions. So uh, my name is Georgia Dillon. I'm a um, resource management compliance officer for Environment Southland. Um, presenting with me is Carl Erickson, who is a land sustainability officer for Environment Southland. Answering questions, we have Fiona Young, who is the uh, manager for land sustainability at Environment Southland. And we also have Pippa Ald, who is a senior policy analyst at uh, Ministry for the Environment, answering questions. Uh, we also have Adrian Henderson, who's going to be helping us with the technology um, and uh, reading out some of the questions. Uh, and she is a comms advisor from uh, Environment Southland also. So we'll get started with the slides. Um, First slide will be a bit of an overall view of um, what we're looking at. So the overall outlook of the presentation, we're going to set the scene, just give a bit of a um, understanding of what the time frames are going to be. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about catchment context, the actions that you're going to need in a farm plan, uh, what support you can get from Environment Southland for developing your farm plan. Um, and finally, what you should be doing now and what you should be um, doing after you've completed those basic steps. And then at the end, we'll have some top tips and some links to provide for you. So on the slide that you should be able to see in front of you, um, you can see the outline of the timeframes for when freshwater farm plans, um, or Southland farm plans are going to need to be submitted for certification um, and the timeframes that you have to develop and then submit for certification. So you can see here that Aparima and uh, Fiordland and Islands area. That regulation turned on on the 1st of August 2023, so a couple of months ago. Um, and from that date, they, uh, those people in that area have 18 months to develop and submit for certification. And everyone in the Southland area, uh, region will have 18 months from the date that the regulations turn on uh, to develop and submit the, uh, um, the uh, plan for certification. So um, you can see here when your due date is going to be um, based on what catchment, what FMU that you're going to be in. So there's, a, there's still a decent amount of time for everyone to develop their farm plan um, and get it submitted for certification. And that doesn't, um, you just have to, the due date is for submitting, it's not for getting um, the farm plan certified. So that's a key point there. Uh, so as long as you're developing it and getting started soon, um, you shouldn't have many problems. So um, the Southam region has had some big challenges um, and has some big challenges ahead to improve water quality outcomes. Uh, Southland Regional Farm Plans are a regulated farm planning process for farmers and growers to provide a practical way to identify, manage and reduce the impacts of farming on the freshwater environment. Um, they were introduced as a key part of the previous government's uh, 2020 Essential Freshwater Package and uh, the Water and Land Plan, which is a regional plan, um, to uh, it's designed to stop decline and ultimately improve water quality, which is the whole goal of the regulated uh, farm planning process. Uh, so Southland farm plan content, what we're looking for in a Southland regional farm plan, uh, what we're looking for is uh, what um, your land units are. So this would be based off the uh, 
you would group them based off soil, climate, landform, um, the type of drainage that they have and any irrigation or activities that you've got on that part of the land. You'll need to include catchment context aspects, which is uh, things such as local information on values and cultural significance within the catchment. And all of that information is available on our uh, Environment Southland website. You'll also need to include all risks related to freshwater from the farm and the actions that you're doing, activities that you're doing on the farm, and they need to be identified. And the catchment context can really help with this and help you narrow down what activities are a risk to freshwater on the farm. You also need to include a nutrient budget, uh, an annual winter grazing plan if you intend to undertake uh, intensive winter grazing, pasture winter grazing in Southland. Um, you also need to include a series of maps illustrating farm information, such as uh, tile drains, waterways on your farm, critical source areas, uh, and different activities on farm that might be high risk, such as your uh, intensive winter grazing plan. Um, and then all of these actions that you come up with that help um, mitigate risk to fresh water, those actions will need to be audited within 12 months of the initial certification of the farm plan. So that's once your farm plan is certified for the first time. <coughs> Thanks, Georgia. Um, so as Georgia has uh, mentioned, the farm plans are a tool to help improve freshwater health. And to achieve this, we need an understanding in the state of the catchment. So catchment context, challenges and values helps farmers to understand those unique matters or sites and species of cultural significance within that catchment. So the context part of catchment context includes that information like landforms and water bodies, with climate information, soil and physiographic information. The challenges part includes the contaminants of concern to water quality and some habitat loss as well. And the values part includes the things that the community wishes to maintain or improve in the catchment. Things like the ability to continue to use waterways for recreation and the harvesting of market and quiet. And as you see in the slide here, um, this is an online catchment context tool that is available to the public now, and you can use it um, to download the specific information from your property. And that is available on our Environment South website. So the actions in a farm plan. Um, actions in a farm plan are really the beating heart of the, of the farm plan. Um, part of this is, is the, the land units um, and physiographic information that help identify those contaminant pathways to help you choose the actions that you're going to need. And so some of those contaminant pathways include overland flow, which is where the, the rainfall washes the landscape and the water finds its way through critical areas and things into the ways. There's an artificial drainage contaminant pathway, and that's normally through tiles and moles and things like that. And then there's the deep drainage aspects, and this includes when nitrates leach through and beyond the root zone. Um, and these actions are, are categorised into, into regulated actions, um, and catchment actions and supplementary actions. So the regulated actions are those actions that are required in a plan um, or in a resource consent. And those catchment actions are those actions that um, uphold those values within the catchment context information. So in terms of risk, actions should address the risk pathway on more contaminants. Um, so for an example, a heavy soil on, on a sloping land with animals on top, that is the risk. Okay, and the pathway is where the contaminant, contaminants can travel overland and into the waterways. And the action would be, as an example, to provide a buffer zone that can filter out those contaminants before they reach the way. So this slide here just shows you some examples of plant plan actions. Um, on the, in the blue there, um, these sorts of actions could address uh, phosphorus and sediment loss. Um, so, so some examples are sediment traps, or, um, a bit of riparian fencing, stock exclusion fencing, um, and even some planting. In terms of nitrogen, catch crops are, are a good action to help reduce nitrate loss after a winter grazing paddock has been finished. And you'll see in this slide here, this is from the Landscape DNA website. 
and this is a really good resource um, if you are looking to create your action plan and your farm plan. Um, it does provide you with a, a bit of an inventory on some of the options that you can choose to address the risks that you have um, present on your farms. So support from Environment Southland. Um, currently we are developing a, a Southland farm planning starter pack and this is really to help with farmers to, who would wish to create their own farm plans. Um, we're hoping to have this out very, very soon. Um, and and as, as I say, this provides guidance and useful resources to assist with creating your, your own plan. Um, there's also the regional specific rules which need to be adhered to. Um, and of course, there may be some help with identifying risks. Uh, there, there will be some help with people who may need to identify risks um, to create those good farm plans. And of course, and the land sustainability team at Environment Southland are here to help. So at any stage through the process, we are able to, to provide um, information that, that can assist you with developing the farm plan. So we have a team of people available. And as I say, we are happy to help. Thanks, Bob. Um, so what can you do now to get you prepared for when uh, the submission for certification due date comes up? So what you need to really do is to know your catchment and certification due date. So what your catchment is and when you're going to need to submit your developed farm plan for certification. For Aparima, um, that's the catchment that has been turned on recently. The due date is the 1st of February 2025. Uh, you need to read through a pastoral farm operator guidance to writing a freshwater farm plan, which is available on the Ministry for the Environment website and the EU's website. This is a document that can really give you an idea on how you can write your own freshwater farm plan or your own Southland farm plan. Um, and that can give you an understanding of whether you will be able to do it by yourself or whether you're going to need to get some assistance from either Environment Southland staff or a consultant. Um, and get a sense of where your existing farm plan needs to be updated. So have a look at any old farm plan that you might have sitting around uh, and see if there needs to be a lot more added to it or just a, a few maps or things like that. So um, you'll need to look at the additional requirements that will be required in the South and Regional Farm Plan and Freshwater Farm Plan regulations. And uh, some of that information can be found in the appendix N on the uh, Regional Water and Land Plan, which is listed on our Environment Southland website. Um, a lot of the older farm plans will need those additional requirements added in. You'll need some time and persistence to do this yourself. So some of you may need to engage with a rural professional to help, and that's better to be done sooner rather than later. Once you've done all of what I've mentioned on the previous slide, um, next you can begin to develop your farm plan. So you can create your farm's land units, create farm maps, which uh, Carl just mentioned you can get help with from the Environment Southland Catchment Context Tool and Environment Southland staff. Uh, you need to obtain your catchment context, which, as I mentioned, from the AES online tool. Identify any farm risks that are um, on your farm and begin creating your farm's action plan. Contact Environment Southland or an industry representative if you need help at any point in the process, and this should be done as soon as possible. Uh, and undertake your due diligence on who you choose as a certifier once you do decide to submit it for certification. So some top tips, um, consider, consider how to make it easy for the certifier and auditor to do their jobs. For example, have some contents pages on your uh, farm plan, do really diligent reporting and record keeping of actions completed and make sure that you're keeping evidence of when these actions are completed. And ensure your actions and your action plan can be completed on time or are doable. For example, fencing off 50 metres of a farm creek within one year of certification. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we've just got some resources listed here and then the number for you to jot down for a land sustainability officer, along with email an email address and our website. Uh, and if you've got any questions for our staff panel, pop them in the chat now and we will uh, get to them as soon as possible.
back to Adrian and Fiona. So we had some questions submitted prior to uh, the webinar, so we'll just run through those and there's some really good ones in the chat as well. So we'll, we'll try and cover off as many as possible. Fantastic. Hi, everyone, uh, and thanks um, so much for joining us today in this webinar. Uh, certainly, I think there's probably opportunity for more, more sessions like this just because there's so much happening within this process. So, look, I'll just touch on a question that was put through to us prior to the meeting. Um, I'm sorry, and just apologies. My name's Fiona Young. I work at Environment Southland. Um, so, a question that came through was how will the freshwater farm plans work in with plan change to Atahi? So for those that don't know, plan change to Atahi is the piece of work that we are embarking on now. It is a new plan change for Environment Southland and intended to um, go through some of the processes, particularly relating to limit setting. So in terms of the freshwater farm plans, there's some real opportunities to come up and be discussed as part of plan change to Atahi. Can I just say those conversations haven't started yet in terms of how they could be adopted or used, but certainly, um, there's a real opportunity here for farmers and for the council uh, in terms of improving water quality. So um, I'll just hand over, I've got a question here that um, I think Carl will be able to touch on. It's been asked, um, what is a Southland farm plan? Carl, does that include both the requirements under the proposed Southland water remand plan uh, or the, and or the freshwater farm plan regulations? If you could just quickly answer, answer that. Yes, that's essentially that's correct. Um, we're not asking for two plans. This is one plan, and it involves an amalgamation of the freshwater farm plan, um, essential freshwater package farm plan, with the water and land plan appendix in. So the appendix in and the water and land plan are the criteria required for a farm plan. So yes, a southland farm plan is an amalgamation of them both. And Carl, are you able to comment on the differences? So obviously we've got a Southland farm plan that will accommodate the needs of those different pieces, uh, regional and national legislation. Um, but what is it that's an appendix in that's perhaps different or in addition to what's required by the freshwater farm plan regulations? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. There's uh, a requirement for a nutrient budget to, to go with uh, a freshwater, uh, sorry, a, a, farm, a Southland farm plan that is in the appendix in. Um, and there is also a need to um, provide an intensive winter grazing plan within your within your Southland farm plan as well. And that, that a freshwater, uh, sorry, a, a grazing plan just in, involves um, those actions that are going to be taken within that freshwater, uh, sorry, within that winter grazing paddock. Um, yeah. So, and as I've said before, um, we are here to help with anything um, that that could be needed to. Uh, to support those requirements. Great, thank you. Um, sorry, another question here for Carl that's come in. So we know that when, the, so for farmers who are you know, developing their um, actions, once they've gone through that risk assessment on their property, um, we know that farmers can include uh, new actions as well as existing actions. But there's another kind of element there in terms of types of actions that can be included. Carl, are you able to just touch on that for people? So the, the types of actions include uh, regulated actions and uh, a, a winter grazing plan is, is uh, a good example of a regulated action. Now these ones take priority, so these ones need to be front and centre of your action plan. Uh, and those other, those other actions include a catchment action. Now these, the catchment action uh, is required to support the, uh, the outcomes provided in the uh, catchment context information. So, for example, if sediment is a priority in your catchment, then a catchment action would be something that would uphold that priority. So you would prioritise uh, actions that support, uh, that, that reduce sediment runoff. Um, and there are, as I've mentioned before, a number of actions that can be taken to reduce sediment loss. The other third part of it, I, I believe, is a, is a supplementary action, and that in the regulations that states any other action that um, is not regulated or is not a catchment action would be a supplementary action. So that could be something that may, for example, um, uh, may may address a, a greenhouse gas emission, even though this isn't. This, this is a these are plans are for freshwater farm plans. Right, thanks, Carl. Um, 
Georgia, uh, are you able to share? So, so there's a question that's come through just around um, how many certifiers we think will be available and when we think those certifiers are going to be available. Um, and we're particularly focused at this stage, obviously, on our Aparima uh, area. So just for those um, in the community listening, Aparima includes uh, three kind of parts. So the first part is the, the Orupuki, uh, area, so um, out west of um, Riverton, and then we have the Aparima and the Podokino, which are grouped together, and then the Waimatoku and the Tanamu, which are also grouped together, so those three areas. So um, certifiers, Georgia, are you able to comment on how many and when we think they'll be likely to be available? So currently we're in the process of de, um, implementing our regional training process for the certifiers. So this is something that certifiers uh, who have applied for the program will need to go through to be able to be appointed by us as certifiers uh, and then being able to certify the farm plan. Um, this is uh, in progress as a workshop, but currently we're still working on uh, training up our um, higher level certifiers who can then train the lower level certifiers. So there's a bit of an on flow and action there. Uh, we're working really hard to get that uh, sorted for you guys as soon as possible. And that's something that should be ready in the next couple of months uh, after Christmas. So at this stage, we don't have any set numbers uh, of the certifiers that are going to be ready by a certain date. And this is something that we're still working on and something that is very much in progress. Great, thank you. Um, so, just again, we've got a question here uh, around just a bit more detail actually around the regulated actions. So, Carl, can you just talk a bit more? So, this, I, I guess the question is around uh, how much the farmer and the certifier need to understand about the rules that are in that, particularly in the proposed Southland Water and Land Plan. Yeah, so regulated actions uh, are those actions that must take first priority in an action plan. And as I mentioned before, our intensive winter grazing is now uh, part of regulation. So if, if uh, for example, there are permitted activity conditions with intensive winter grazing, and that, that are things like critical source area protection, five metre buffer from waterways, and um, so grazing on slopes less than 10 degrees. So the, because they are a regulation, they need to be front and centre of the action plan to, to show the certifier that that is a priority that you that you are um, that, that action you are taking will address that regulated action requirement. But there are also regulations within a resource consent, for example, like a condition that that uh, might be within a resource consent for dispersing effluent over a field, and and they need to be um, included in that action plan as to show certifiers that you are giving effect to that priority. Okay. Um, so we have been asked about the intensive winter grazing requirements and how they fit in with the proposed Southland Water and Land Plan. Uh, I think it's worth sharing with the audience uh, and the listeners that we recently received uh, a key decision from the Environment Court about our proposed Southland Water and Land process. We are in the process of actually developing up um, information and materials to help people understand the content of that, um, that decision. And so basically that is almost all of the, the aspects of the proposed plan are, are finalised now, not quite all of them. So please, um, and if I can point out, if you're looking at the screen now, you'll see a snapshot of our website and you'll see a circle around freshwater farm plans. So can I say for anything to do with farm planning, uh, click on that tile and we are working reasonably hard to try and make sure we've got all the relevant information sitting behind that. But in terms of the proposed plan, there's also a, um, a tile that will be sitting there that will be a place you go. So if you're developing your farm plan, you need to understand what the regulations are. Look to those tiles because they should give you some assistance to where you can find that information in a perhaps um, more summarised version than looking through the whole plan itself. But it is true that you do need to have a reasonable understanding of the key activities, particularly as they relate to your, your particular property. Um, so that's the proposed plan. And in terms of intensive winter grazing, uh, as I said, we've recently received this uh, latest decision and are working quite hard uh, to know whether 
um, people still can have, sorry, we are working quite hard to pull that information together. At this stage, it looks likely that people will need a farm plan, uh, will need a resource consent for winter grazing next winter if they trigger the permitted activity criteria. Now, I realise that's quite a mouthful, so we will make sure that when you click on intensive winter grazing on that tile there, you'll have the kind of short story about whether you need a consent or not. But it will be quite similar to last year in terms of who required a consent. Uh, the new plan, it looks uh, likely that it will mean that a, the farm plan is not a, a pathway for getting a consent, that you'll need to get a consent anyway. But please, we are still working through that. And as soon as we have decisions on that, we will have that available via our website. Um, just looking at some of the questions. And just to actually um, remind people, we are noting down these questions and we will make the presentation available uh, and we will come back to you with some of the answers for questions that haven't been addressed in this presentation today. Um, one of the things that's come through to us uh, is uh, the question of, of uh, economic analysis. So what economic analysis was done uh, around the actual implementation of this. And so at a national level, uh, there was work done as part of the regulatory impact assessment to help understand the costs of setting up this entire freshwater farm plant system. For us in Southland, we have uh, over some years been working on a regional economic model that looks at the testing, the impact of, and the, um, and the benefits of different mitigations. So we've actually, um, we've got that piece of work and again, there's information available if you'd like on that. What we will do as we head into Plan Change to Atahi is even further refine some of that information. And so there is work coming, not underway yet, to look at the impact of uh, different scenarios, whether it be mitigations and all the processes around farm planning uh, that actually um, will be tested and, and information will become available. It's not available yet. Um, but it is coming. Uh, Carl or, or um, Georgia, I've just been asked how often will a farmer need to certify their farm plan? Every five years? Yep, every five years is when your farm plan will need to be certified. Or if you are buying a new farm, um, you can adopt the um, farm plan that the previous farmer had, or you can get a new farm plan that would then need to be certified. And Carl, what happens uh, if you've got, say, two properties? So say you've got a piece of land um, that you're farming in the Aparima area, and you've got another piece of land that you're farming out of Orapuki. Um, what would that mean for a farm plan development process? No. 100%, but I'm, I'm sure that, especially if they're in dis, dis, dif, different catchments, it will require different actions. And so the, the catchment context piece um, provides the information there for, for the characteristics unique to each catchment. So, yes, it is likely that there will be uh, separate farm plans required for each of those properties. Thank you. And I'm just, um, I wonder, you touched on it quite briefly. Obviously, we have the catchment context information uh, in our, on our website. Can you just explain in a bit more detail what, like, if you're a, you know, if I'm a farmer going on to, to get that information, what exactly am I doing? How do I go through that? Yeah, so you access the catchment context tool by um, clicking on that freshwater farm plans tile that you see on the screen there. And once you go into that, you can scroll on the left hand side of the page there's a piece that says catchment context challenges and values and you can click on that and that takes you into um, the catchment context page and about midway down that page there's the link to the access to the online tool which is the catchment context tool now once you get into that you'll be able to see a map that shows the, the, the different catchments within the Aparima FMU and then it's a matter of zooming into your farm property. And once you've found out where your farm property is within that within that tool, you can draw the boundary that the farm that the farm is uh, the actual farm boundary. And then with a double click on once you've drawn the farm boundary, you can um, access the relevant catchment context information. So some farm plans will straddle different catchments, that is some part of the farm would be in the Aparima, for example, and the other part of the farm may be in the Wamatuku. 
So you will get two pieces of catchment context information if that is the case for you. And you've got information in there about how to make a link between the, the catchment context, the risks and the actions? Yes, that's right. There is a, a guidance document within that too, which is when, when you do your, you've settled on your farm boundary and you've double clicked the information appears. There is some guidance there that helps you to develop your catchment your catchment actions within your farm plan. Um, yeah, the, and there again, that just look, looks at the physiographic information and sort of sets out or spells out how you might um, understand what the priority contaminant is, understand the risk and the pathways. And also there are some examples of actions that address each each contaminant pathway and each, each risk. So it really is a, I guess it's a, a it's a, it's a tool to help people develop their farm plan actions alongside other, other, other pieces of information that are available too. Sorry, Carl, another question for you. Uh, and it's touching back on the, the question we had around the types of actions. So I guess if I was a farmer out in an area in the Upper Rima that had sort of a bit of flat land and then it kind of went up onto a bit of a hill with some sloping land, um, I guess my first question is, what are the types of mitigations that that farmer might be thinking about? And then I'll come back with a second question in a minute. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess it, the types of mitigations you adopt really does depend on the risks that um, that 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 farming activity is is incurring. So, for example, on those flat areas in, in the Apodema, the, um, there could be poorly drained um, soils and there could be a risk of uh, overland flow contaminant pathways emerging. So, um, physiographic information and the soil information that you get in the catchment context uh, will provide that information for you to tell you what those risk factors are. And then you can start to craft the actions that you know would help to address this. So that would be things like providing buffer zones along waterways, uh, keeping stock out of the waterways, um, uh, managing those critical source areas. Um, that would be another another example. Um, yeah, so getting up onto the terraces um, or up onto the, to the slopes, obviously, um, where there is slope, there is an added risk factor, the um, risk um, of contaminants traveling down slopes and into waterways through critical source areas. And so that that would be another factor that you would consider if you were to, to um, craft your actions to reduce those risks. Thanks. And the second part to that question is what happens if a farmer feels like they've actually done all of the actions? You know, the, all their waterways are fenced off. Um, uh, what might they think about then, or how might they go about preparing or listing the actions in their farm plan, Carl? Yeah, well, there may well be some examples of this, um, and that will come down to the certifiers and whether they feel that all of the address, the risks that are present on that property have been addressed. And so it might well pass a certification um, if everything there looks like it's all the risk factors and everything that um, go towards reducing uh, contaminant loss. If they feel that has been addressed and it would likely pass the certification straight off. And just thinking, we haven't talked too much about the, the broader system of certification and auditing, but um, Georgie, can you just make some commentary on, on how you imagine that the resource management compliance team might be involved in this process uh, into the future? So we haven't completely um, come up with our compliance strategy for this uh, process going forward. We're focusing on getting our certifiers trained up and then um, again appointing certifiers and auditors. The compliance team uh, strategy won't change hugely, um, but this is something that's still being developed and we'll need to go through governance and Environment Southland to make a decision on how we're going to proceed with monitoring on that. Um, uh, so far as we, Environment Southland compliance officers, will not be auditing the farm plans. That is going to be an external uh, appointed auditors. So um, that's that's a clarification that I can make now. But anything else, that's something that still needs to be decided by uh, governance and Environment Southland. Thanks, thanks, Georgia. Hey, listen, we've got a number of questions here, and um, as I said at the start, we will come back to some of these questions and make sure there are, is sort of a Q&A up um, with the presentation, but there's 
quite a body of questions around whether once a farmer has gone through the process to certify their farm plan, what happens if partway through that five-year period, uh, a new regional plan or the new plan change comes to bear? What does that mean for the farm plan? So, so let me just make a couple of comments here uh, on this one. So firstly is that we've mentioned um, recertification is a minimum of five years uh, or if there is a significant change to the farming process. So that's the first thing to be very conscious of. The second thing is that if a new plan comes along during that five-year period, um, the first thing I would say is there is a part of the RMA or a requirement that allows a lead-in time once a plan has gone through the process and then become operative. Um, so once a plan has gone through a full process, uh, and then has become operative, there is always the opportunity for uh, what's called Section 20A rights or the opportunity for there to be a six-month period by which things have to be updated. Then as part of that plan process also, there is the opportunity within the plan process to accommodate timeframes depending on the urgency of the situation and the seriousness of the impacts. So my apologies, I cannot give you sort of a straightforward answer to that. But as we go through the plan change to Atahi project, providing input in around sort of the practical implementation considerations is really, really important. Uh, so again, please look into that blue tile and then um, give us a few days just to update things, but look into the blue tile because firstly, there is information that will be updated based on some of these questions and the farm plan process. But also importantly, we are doing a piece of work around the uh, recent decision and the proposed Southland Water and Land Plan to try and uh, help with understanding of the requirements of that plan. Um, we've been asked a question here around the catchment objective, if it was around the reduction of nitrogen, um, how, would that, how does that work in terms of the farm plan? So this is, I think Carl touched on, uh, one of the Appendix N characteristics and that you're required a nutrient management tool or nutrient budget tool of some kind uh, to be filled in as part of your farm plan. Depending on which catchment you are in and the current understanding of the state of water quality in that catchment, there may be a requirement to show some reduction. Within the farm plans, we have not specified how much reduction at this point in time. And the topic of how much reduction is coming as part of the plan change to a Tahi discussion. And we do not want to kind of prejudice that or um, impact on that conversation. So just to be clear, as part of the Appendix N component of your Southland Farm Plan, uh, at this stage, you will need a nutrient budget tool. If you are in a catchment there where there are some serious water quality issues, uh, some examples of how you are or actions around how you're reducing nitrogen will be relevant. However, the amount by which you have to reduce is to come as part of our plan change to Atahi discussions, and, and those are still to unfold. Just checking now back on the questions. So will auditors be warranted on their farm visit like a compliance monitoring officer under the RMA? Yeah, so in terms of the audit process, so that's been set up in the system as a separate group of people that will go out. Um, the role of the auditors is to confirm that the actions listed in that farm plan have been completed. So it, that is the role of the auditors. To become an auditor, you go through a process uh, somewhat similar to the, the certifier. So there is a process that is at this stage being administered um, externally to the council, uh, by a short quality, and so people at this point can apply to go through the process to be accepted as a certifier. Uh, in time, I believe it's not quite set up yet, uh, they will be able to go through that process and they will have uh, the ability to go on farm and be, um, be able to audit the farm plans. Uh, I'm not sure that they will be warranted in the same way that our compliance monitoring officers are. Um, I think it's no, they won't be, one. Fiona. Sorry, just to jump in there, they won't be warranted officers. Um, thank you, Pippa. Excellent. Thanks. So they're not warranted officers like compliance officers, but they will have gone through a process um, uh, to be to be actually qualified as audit auditors. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Um. And obviously, there's a um, 
comment there uh, regarding the different types of return periods, if you like, or revisits for um, for the uh, auditors in and, and so, sorry, for the auditors. Um, obviously, it depends on the audit grade that you receive as to how frequently that you would return. So I guess there's a loop back there to the conversation that uh, Carl, the things that Carl discussed in terms of the types of actions and ensuring that you do make sure that the actions that you're writing down make sense um, in terms of your business model and for your farm and for the environment. Pippa, is, is there anything else that you just wanted to comment on at this stage? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah, you guys have covered it off for the most part, I think. Great, thanks. Hey, well, listen, we're um, we're coming to 12.45. We're a couple of minutes away, but um, at this point, I think what we'll do is draw the, the session to a close. Um, we're extremely grateful for everyone coming today and listening. Uh, we do hope there's a few farmers from the Upper Ema uh, listening to us as well, because we're, we're really keen to, to work with you guys and to help support whatever you need in terms of starting the preparation of these farm plans. Uh, we are coming, I believe, to a Tao next week. There's some um, conversations underway to, to talk to uh, people in the, in the Tao Tao greater Aparema area um, and we've got some other work underway to try and help people who for example want to print off farm maps and some of the documentation um, we're standing up a, 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 a next year we hope to stand up a process to be able to make that easier for farmers but in any case um, we will have this information uh, available as I say, when I say within the next few days, it will be sometime next week. Um, you'll see on the screen there, if you want some assistance, um, please look to Land Sustainability Officers. There's a farm plans email address there at ES, some resources that you might like to look at. Um, and again, just really grateful. Uh, thanks to our presenters, Carl, uh, and thank you, Georgia. Thank you all for listening today, and we'll look forward to catching up again. Have a great weekend, everyone. Kakite. Um, for the overall thing, so like the noise wouldn't have been heard, but yeah. so that's stretching today. <laughs> Does everyone double check? I think we're off. We're gone, aren't we?